In the late 1960s, the Ravel Model Company began including audio records along with some of their kits. I can remember listening to my brother's records for the Wildcat kit and for the PBY Catalina kit. I could not find those two, but I did locate two others on eBay recently, one for the Yunkers JU-88 Night Raiders and the other for the Japanese Zero. I acquired them and thought it would be an interesting exercise in nostalgia to share them with you. So now, for everyone who used to build models back in the 1960s and remember these records that came with Ravel kits, I offer you this little trip to the past. And if anyone out there happens to have the one for the Wildcat or the PBY, would you consider posting it, please? Should the invader come to Britain, there will be no placid lying down of the people in submission before him, as we have seen, alas, in other countries. We shall defend every village, every town, and every city. This is London. Tonight, we are again under attack by the Luftwaffe. The Raiders are coming in now. They are Ju-88 aircraft, Junkers night fighters. A barrage balloons have been raised. When the enemy flies into the balloon cables, his wings will be sheared off. There goes a balloon. I can see it floating up in the glare of our searchlights. But what happened? A Ju-88 flew right into a cable and cut it apart. These night raiders have wire cable cutters on the edges of their wings. They're slicing right through our cable. Washington, D.C. Ju-88 planes are attacking Russia, covering an invasion by Nazi ground forces. Moscow reports the planes are almost undetectable camouflaged a pure white to blend with the snow. London calling. Allied shipping is being hit on the North Sea and off the coast of Scotland by Ju-88's launching torpedoes. The RAF claims the Junkers night fighter has some uncanny way of detecting our bombers over Germany. So far, we've been unable to effect a countermeasure. Here is an important bulletin. The ministry has just revealed that a German crew has defected to England in a Ju-88. We take you now to Farnborough. This is Squadron Leader Hartley. Two days ago, the crew of a Ju-88, pilot, engineer, and wireless operator, flew here from Germany. Their machine is an R1 model. Two liquid-cooled inverted V 12-cylinder engines. We've been testing the machine, flying it up to 14,000 feet, and dogfighting with one of our own bow fighters. The Ju-88 was originally built as a rugged dive bomber so it is the largest night fighter in use. This makes it very smooth to handle. It's a bit faster than our own machines. I was somewhat cramped in the cockpit, though, and the windscreen is like a beetle's eye with many braces. While flying it, I felt as if I were peering through prison bars. But the most important discovery is a new type of device we found in the machine, a radar. This has been the Ju-88 secret weapon to detect our bombers. Now, perhaps, we will be able to find a countermeasure for the Ju-88. Window is the new countermeasure against the radar-guided night fighters. Strips of metal foil are dropped from our bombers on their runs into Germany. The clouds of foil disrupt the Ju-88 radar. Now we can get to our targets more safely. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. The invasion is on. My fellow Americans, last night when I spoke with you about the fall of Rome, I knew at that moment that troops of the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another and greater operation. It has come to pass with success thus far. At Normandy, Allied forces move from boats onto the mainland. Here come the Ju-88s. They're going after the ships. Wait, he's heading right forward. It crashed into a ship! This must be Operation Beethoven, code name for the all-out attack we've been expecting. 
An unmanned Ju-88 is loaded with a 7,000-pound charge that explodes on impact. A pilot in a small fighter plane rides piggyback on the Ju-88, guiding it in, then disconnects as the Ju-88 heads down with its bomb. This is the enemy's last attempt at attack, sacrificing the Ju-88. The tide is turning. France is now on the advance. Frenchmen have captured an airfield abandoned by the Luftwaffe with Ju-88s. The French are flying them now, hitting the enemy with his own planes. The versatility of the Ju-88 was unmatched. It roamed the skies, fighting everywhere, over Europe, North Africa, Russia, the Middle East. Nearly 4,000 were built and used as dive bombers, night fighters, flying bombs, torpedo bombers, and even as glider tugs for carrying troops. And most amazing, this unique warplane was the brainchild of Al Gassner, an American. He designed it while working in Europe in 1936, during a time of peace. There, that does it. Hey, Dad, come take a look at my Zero model now. Doesn't it look great? You sure did a good job on it, son. Looks just like the real thing. Reminds me of the first time I saw a Zero. Did I ever tell you about that? You mean the story about when you were at Pearl Harbor, Dad? Yeah, that's right. I was stationed at Kaneohe Airfield. And let me tell you, I remember December 7th, 1941, just like it was yesterday. You know, we all thought that Zero was made of bamboo and rice paper. But we sure got the surprise of our lives. Well, anyway, it was early Sunday. And Charlie Dunn and I had drawn maintenance. At midnight today, December 8, 1941, our Army and Navy opened hostilities with the American and British forces. Our victorious Sea Eagles have launched several highly successful... These were the words which first announced to the Japanese people the fact that they had embarked on a global war. The words which heralded the saga of the Zero Fighter, an aircraft whose very concept revolutionized the standards of aerial warfare. For the first time in the history of flight, a shipboard-based fighter was capable of besting all of its land-based opponents. The Zero was flown with pride by the pilots of the Imperial Navy. As an ex-Zero pilot put it in a recent interview, Captain Kimura, as Zero pilot during the Pacific War, do you remember when your first action took place? Yes, my first experience of combat took place at Pearl Harbor in 1941. What were your advanced feelings about how your first encounter would turn out? Oh, I knew we would have the advantage in a dogfight. I can remember sitting in my Zero fighter on the flight deck of the Soryu, waiting for the launch signal, with the words of our commander echoing in my ears. Expect a severe battle. Fight a brave battle. Be victorious, Sea Eagles. I was attached to the 3rd Covering Fighter Squadron, commanded by the famous Lieutenant Aida. There were three flights of three aircraft each, all flying the new Zero fighter. Although I had joined the Soryu after the operations in China, I personally felt that the Americans had no aircraft which was capable of besting my Zero in combat. The Zero had almost twice the range of our earlier Type 96 fighters, and was a real pleasure to fly. Yes, we could hardly wait to meet the enemy over Pearl Harbor. The combat effectiveness of the Zero was a deadly surprise to the pilots flying the P-36s and P-40s in the Pacific. Although lightly armored by Western standards, the superior speed and maneuverability of the Zero enabled it to emerge the victor in almost all of its early engagements. In fact, although only nine Zeros were lost in the Pearl Harbor raid, the majority of these were shot down by anti-aircraft gunfire rather than from aerial combat. Our assigned target was Kaneohe Airfield. As we approached, we were met by six or seven P-36s. I was flying with the third V, and the P-36s were shot down before my flight even made contact. I think that the Zero fighter came as a great surprise to them. I suppose, Captain, that you were aware of the story which circulated during the war that the Zero was made of bamboo. This was also a great joke to us. We used to laugh and say we would shoot down enemy with bamboo bullets from our rice paper airplanes. Were you hit at any time during the Pearl Harbor operation? No, I did not receive any hits at all. But I remember when Lieutenant Aida was downed. After we destroyed the fighter defenses, we went down to strafe the field, and Lieutenant Aida 
was hit in the fuel tanks by ground fire. Although he had lost much fuel, I think personally he could have flown back to the Soryu, but he chose instead to dive his zero into the hangar area and exploded in a great ball of flame. On June 3rd, 1942, the Japanese tried to take Midway, to break the fighting spirit of the Allies and to force them to the surrender table. It was a key contest in the Pacific War, and the defeat of the Japanese forces at Midway signaled the beginning of the end of the supremacy of the Zero fighter. Then, inevitably, the Zero lost its role as the fighter supreme of the Pacific, with the advent of better Allied aircraft, such as the Hellcat or P-51 Mustang. Even then, the Zero fought on, diving to its death in every flight as the Kamikaze. Of course, towards the end of 1944, my Zero was outclassed terribly by your latest fighters. And this, with the shortage of spare parts and fuel, gave us a great feeling of frustration. At this time, I was based in Yokohama. And when the Go Out and Fight banner was flown, we all raced to the freight line to be sure of having a Zero to fly. Every hour or so, the alarm sounded, and there were always fist fights among my fellow pilots when two of them reached the same aircraft together. The destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki sounded the death knell of the Zero, accomplishing what the combined efforts of all the allies in the Pacific could not. The day of the Zero was over, but the concepts of naval air operations which were pioneered by the brave men who flew the Zero will always remain. Mention the word Zero to any veteran of the Pacific War, and once again the exploits of the Sakais, Aidas, and Kepfords come to life, reminding us of the times when the Zero truly controlled the skies, from the ice-bound Aleutians to the slopes of Mount Fuji. <laughs> <laughs>